On December 10, 1954, while riding a rocket powered sled, Stapp set a land record speed of 632 miles per hour in five seconds. At the time, he would survive the greatest G-forces endured by a man of 46.2 Gs. What's going on, everyone? And welcome to In the Name of Science. We're your hosts, Chris Howard, Josh Jacobs, and Eddie Fernandez. Today's episode is all about United States Air Force Colonel John Paul Stop. How do you say his name, Josh? Is it Stapp or Stop? I say Stapp. Stapp? Or is it Stapp with a Boston? Stop. Oh, Bastard uh, Stapp? Bastard oh, that was, that was John Stapp. <laughs> <laughs> you, better, you better be careful with John Stapp. He's in a pack of plane on Harvard Yard. So anyway, Stapp, he felt the need for speed. Yeah. And yes, get ready for a ton of Top Gun references because on December 10, 1954, while riding a rocket powered sled, Stapp set a land record speed of 632 miles per hour in five seconds. At the time, he would survive the greatest G forces endured by a man of 46.2 Gs. And he did this all in the name of science. Picture it, the year was 1954. The Supreme Court rules on Brown versus the Board of Education, stating that segregation in public schools is unconstitutional. Ellis Island in New York closes as a point of immigration. Social security is signed into law. Hydrogen bomb tests are conducted on a bikini atoll in the Pacific Ocean. And most importantly, Swanson introduces TV dinners. Doing the Lord's work since 1954. Thanks, Swanson. You guys are the real ones. You know, I was just thinking about this. Is, like, uh, SpongeBob, like, was he created during the Bikini Atoll uh, explosions of 1954? That is a theory. Interesting. Hmm. I mean, they all talk. They're all weird. There's a starfish. They're all mutated. Clancy Brown plays one of them. Bikini bottom. Ah, wow, we are. This is a conspiracy theory. I love it. Yeah, yeah. This is the rabbit Bob hole. Bob is. Listen, Ghostbusters, the original one, covered this when uh, they talked about the mass sponge migration. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Going deep with his uh, with his Ghostbuster lore today. I love it. Yes, sir. What is the What's the name of the book that Dan Aykroyd refers to? Tobin in... Spirit Guide. Thank you. There we go. Okay, Come you on. you have been redeemed. Back to uh, what was I talking about? I don't even Your remember. Grandmother. Yeah, but what was I? Oh, Swanson's. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My grandmother used to make me eat those things, and I mean, they were never fully cooked properly. The peas were always disgusting. It just didn't work. But she also gave me Celadoro breadsticks. Do you guys remember those? They weren't mm. actually breadsticks. They were. They were called breadsticks. They were shaped in an S and they were actually cookies. So truth in advertising, yeah, you know, you gotta love it. Stelladora breadsticks. I mean, listen, if I could just interject here, um, you need to shut your mouth about TV dinners because the best Salisbury steaks I've ever had. This is true. Came out of TV dinners. This is true. I have this to agree with Eddie on that. Okay, the palates of you two must be so beaten down by all the GMOs and glyphosates that you guys have eaten over the years. Listen, the, the fact that you think that, that is crazy. Listen, bologna sandwiches were a staple in my house, so my palate mm -hmm. is all over the place. Yep, Truth. hey, listen, if the world ends tomorrow, Chris and I will be fine while you're out there trying to find the perfect wine to pair with your roadkill. I mean, listen, there. I've seen people eat roadkill all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a... Uh, it's an acquired taste for sure, but hey, you'll never go hungry. <laughs> Raccoon tartar. <laughs> <laughs> but something else happened in 1954 that was one for the record books. Hmm. Literally, John Paul Stapp broke the land speed record and decelerated from 632 miles per hour to zero in 1.4 seconds, all while simply strapped to a sled with giant rockets on the back. Now, before we get into all of this, let's talk about what a G or G-force is because it's integral in understanding just how insane Stop was. While there is now, a... 
yeah. before you go into that explanation, Chris, I just wanted to let you know that I think of the three of us in this group, you're probably the one with the most experience finding the G-Force. <laughs> you know what? You, I, I would agree. Given my, you know, former professional background, it did allow me the privilege of exploring a lot of G-Forces. So yeah, there you I go. I feel like Josh couldn't find it if it sat on his face. Mm, we're, going, we're going there early. So yeah. Chris was talking about the legitimacy of the G-Force that he felt when playing in the NFL and college sports. Eddie, on the other hand, was alluding to the fact that I don't know how to find a certain part of something in the female anatomy. I will uh, stop talking about... The... <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, <laughs> while there is a much more scientific explanation, the easiest way to think about it is this. The amount of force you feel pulling you towards the earth when you're standing still is essentially one G. Now, let's say you get into a 2024 Ford Mustang Mach-E GT and you absolutely floor it. That feeling you have of being pushed into your seat, that happens because your body has to essentially catch up to the car. And in that moment, you're feeling the equivalent of extra weight, more Gs. Essentially, multiply your body weight by however many Gs you're, you're feeling, and that's how much you effectively weigh during an acceleration. So, if you get into a rocket sled that accelerates to 600 plus miles per hour in seconds, you'll feel around 45 Gs. So, for a very healthy but uh, strong man of 250 pounds, I mean, he would have he would effectively feel like he weighs 11,250 pounds. That's a huge bit. <laughs> so with a certain level of G's hitting you, moving any body part gets a lot harder because of the heavy force pushing against it. With a strong enough G force, you can actually black out because all the blood is forced from the top of the body to the bottom. And no blood means sleepy time. Note to self, get human sized centrifuge for a better night's sleep. I mean, you live in Denver. There's other stuff you can try. You know that, right? I already have a my weed pillow. It's I. Right. <laughs> so let's go back to G forces for a second. Have you guys at like I've never actually been in a car that provides that kind of level of G force, but I have been told that the Tesla at ludicrous speed would provide something as insane as that. Have you guys ever been in that kind of a car? Yeah, so the thing is this, when you talk about a traditional combustion engine vehicle with a transmission, that transmission has to shift gears in order to create the torque to, to move you, right, at whatever speed. Uh, an electric vehicle does not have that. So there isn't like a curve, like what you would see in a gas vehicle, it's just always level, hmm. which yep. means it accelerates really fast and right out of the gate. Um, and so, yeah, the Tesla, even without ludicrous speed, is extremely fast, especially if it's a dual motor model. Um, it's a lot. And it's one of those things where you see somebody driving it or like a Ford F-150 Lightning, and they say, wow, that sucker's fast, but it doesn't mean anything to you until you get into it. And it effectively buries you into the back of your seat. <laughs> and you know, all right, here, here's another test, Chris, because I know Eddie knows where this is from, but do you know where Tesla got ludicrous speed. Wait. Boo, 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 it's like on it's on it. it I was gonna say it's on the tip of my tongue, but then I just knew Eddie was gonna say something nasty about me saying that. Um I'll give you a clue. One of the main characters in the film is a Druish princess. Druish. Oh, space walls. Exactly. Boom. They've nice. gone to plaid, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what a great movie. Yogurt the Powerful. Yogurt the Wise. <laughs> eh, just plain yogurt. Uh, and then of course my favorite is um, <laughs> Comb the Desert. We ain't found sh <laughs> You know that was Tim Russ who played Tuvok in Star Trek Voyager? I did not know that. Yeah, I only found out a couple years ago rewatching the movie. And then I've seen interviews where he's like, yeah, everybody knows me as this Vulcan character. And then 
every once in a while somebody will point out that I did space balls and then that gets me even more people wanting to ask me questions than Star Trek. He's I mean, like it's one of the greats. I, it is. I showed up I showed up for like one day's worth of work for that scene and I did Voyager for seven years. All I'm gonna say, Eddie, is <laughs> <laughs> All right. So military pilots are trained for this type of occurrence and also have special suits that compress their lower body, making it harder for blood to flow from their heads to their feet, which help avoid blacking out. And if you're a good pilot with lots of training, you can also withstand up to 10 Gs, which brings us back to staff, who withstood a whopping 46.2 Gs, WTF. John Paul Staff was born in Brazil on July 11th, 1910. He was the son of missionary parents. He was homeschooled until he was 12. Initially, Staff wanted to be a writer, but when his baby cousin died, he was inspired to pursue a job in medicine. In 1931, he got a BA in English from Baylor University and in 1932 an MA in zoology because he couldn't afford med school. So of course it makes sense to go study animals, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Then after working for a few years, he got his PhD in biophysics from University of Texas. By 1944, he had completed his degree just in time for World War II, where he was assigned to Pratt Army Air Base in Kansas as a general duty medical officer. But a BA in English, an MA in zoology, a PhD in biophysics, and an MD degree weren't enough for this guy. And so he got his aviation medical examiner designation, where he was transferred to the Aeromedical Lab at Wright Air Development Center in Ohio in the biophysics branch. A bit of a maverick. Yeah. His first assignment was testing oxygen systems in an unpressurized aircraft at 40,000 feet. And of course, he volunteered himself. Studying the effects of altitude sickness and decompression sickness in pilots, he felt the best way to do this was to take a B-17 bomber, which is a, a pretty big plane, military plane, rip it apart down to the bare bones and personally fly it with an open cockpit completely unpressurized for 65 hours at 45,000 feet. How did he do this is beyond me because with no pressurization at 45,000 feet, which is basically 15,000 feet higher than the peak of Everest, he could also die of hypothermia or get messed up with a type of frostbite. Now, somehow he survived. And what he discovered from this was that if you huffed pure oxygen for 30 minutes before you take off, most pilots could deal with crazy high altitude and literally not have their heads blow up. This discovery led to the development of high altitude aircraft spy planes and halo parachute jumps. Was Airplane the movie where the in-flight movie was a plane crash? <laughs> oh no, I don't remember that. That, that would be hysterical. Or how about when the old lady speaks jive? Yes. Yeah, that was, uh, that was. I'm sorry. Hilarious. I'm sorry, stewardess. I speak jive. <laughs> Don't look at the black guy. I'm not about to speak jive. So let's pull back on those flaps for a second and talk about Mission Impossible and Top Gun for a minute. That halo skydiving sequence of 25,000 feet traveling at a speed of 265 miles per hour was the last sequence filmed during the production but it was the first stunt designed and required a full year of planning out. Because the last thing you want to do is just go for it when you've got Tom Cruise and Henry Cavill leaping out of a plane. The crew had only a limited time window of three minutes a day during sunset to film a jump. And because the French were like, Sacre bleu, il n'est pas question qu'on sait du Arthur me rend dans notre pas nous permettons seulement à déverrer Arthur comme gère le l'ouest de sauter vers les montagnes en France. For those of you who do not speak French, the translation is there is no way these two actors are going to fall to their deaths in our country. We only allow real actors like Jerry Lewis to fall to their deaths in France. It took Tom Cruise, Henry Cavill, the skydiving camera operator Craig O'Brien, who was instructed to keep at a distance of three feet from Cruise while filming, and others involved a total of 106 jumps to get three possible takes. However, to rehearse the sequence, the crew built a custom oxygen helmet with RAF assistance that can be lit up to see a face 
and then also built one of the world's largest wind tunnels for practice. Cruz and the other persons involved did five skydives a day with one in the morning and three in the afternoon and one at dusk. Some of the other cast members turned up to visit with Simon Pegg saying that he and his co-stars thought multiple times that Cruz was seriously about to die. Quote, it is a daily stress going to work with him because you don't know if you're going to see him tomorrow. That's crazy. Because in Top Gun, stunt pilot Art Scholl, is that Scholl, Josh, or Scholl? I, I don't know. If you're German, it's Scholl. Scholl. If you're not, it's Scholl. <laughs> okay. No in Top Gun, stunt pilot Art Scholl was killed during the production of the movie. He died when his Pitts S2 camera plane failed to recover from a flat spin and crashed into the Pacific Ocean. Scholl's last words over the radio were, I have a problem. I have a real problem. The exact cause of the crash was never determined, and neither the aircraft nor Scholl's body were ever recovered. The film is actually dedicated to him. And finally, before Top Gun was offered to Tom Cruise, John Travolta was initially approached with the need, the need for speed, and offered the role of Maverick. However, after he and his agent were playing hardball for heavy amounts of cash, and so the producers were like, negative ghostwriter, the pattern is full, and they put John in the ejector seat and sent him packing and brought in Tom Cruise. That's not what I heard at all. I actually heard that his Vinnie Barbarino haircut didn't fit in the helmet. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my that's my best Vinnie Barbarino. Me. So next up, Stapp studied the human body's ability to withstand G-forces during deacceleration to help figure out ways to save pilots during plane crashes. He also believed that pilots could withstand more than the believed 18 Gs of pressure before dying. So again, he took it upon himself instead of using others for these experiments. First, he went out and found the 2000 foot railway track at Edwards Air Force Base, which I think is the sled Indiana Jones and the bad guy fight on during Kingdom of the Crystal Skull at the start of the movie. Because I know everyone was thinking about that. This track had originally been used uh, to test V1 rockets. But Stapp decided the best new use of this was to build a 1500 pound rocket sled, strap himself in, and hope for the worst beating his body could handle just to prove his theory. I've gone to parties like that. Can you imagine <laughs> strap me into your rocket daddy being your last words? <laughs> no. <laughs> now, hold on a second. Diff- hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's go back because there's one thing we we haven't talked about. So Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark is my favorite movie of all time. I believe it is an absolutely Same perfect here. movie. It's uh, uh, Last Crusade for me. Ooh. You think Last Crusade is better than the first one? Negative, Ghost Rider. Mm. That's not what I said. I said it's my favorite Indiana Jones movie. Um, I think objectively Raiders is a better movie, but I just like Crusade better. Listen, it's so quotable. I mean, Yehovah is spelled with an I, Indy. Only the penitent man shall pass. Or how about on the beach with the umbrella and the birds? I suddenly remembered my Charlemagne. Let my armies be the rocks and the trees and the birds in the sky. (laughs) We named the the dog Indiana. I like the scene where the girl's like, your father talks in his sleep. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Look at Sean. It is, a qu- it is your, all right, I'll give you that. It is a, an incredibly quotable movie of all the movies that they did. Now, let, the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Crystal Skull though, is god awful. And the minute Terrible. Shia LaBeouf is swinging with yeah. horrible 3D the monkeys, monkeys yeah. you lost me. I'm out. I feel like I feel like if you had taken the monkeys out of that movie, it would have been just that one scene. It would have been so much better. We could have Giant gotten over. Ants, yeah, fine. we could have. We could have gotten over Kate Blanchett's <laughs> Russian accent easily. <laughs> How dare you? She's, have you rewatched it recently? She's my crush. Don't you talk about Kate Blanchett like that? She's wonderful, but her accent sucked in that movie. Mm, all right. Sorry. Um, so there's a difference between being a groundbreaking speed freak and just crazy. And thankfully, Stapp was the first guy. He knew that before jumping onto the rocket sled, he would need to run some tests to make sure it was feasible in the first place. Maybe establish a safe word while he was at it. It was a prudent move that prevented him from, as the kids say today, 
going from biology to physics in a fraction of a second. RIP. What kids, uh, what kids say that today? The ones that went on that submarine. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Way to so bring April, down the mood. So on April 30th, 1947, the sled took off San Stapp. It flew off the tracks and exploded. 18 months later, he tried again. This time, the sled sped up to 150 miles per hour, stopped short, and shot the crash test dummy head first through the two feet of wood and then 700 feet further down the dirt road. Biology to physics. Man. And it was the next time that Stop stopped everything, took the dummy out of the pilot's chair and told his crew, we're not using this. I'm going to be the test dummy and boom, just like that, he was off hitting 200 miles per hour and slamming into a complete stop within a few seconds. But while his first run had involved no serious injuries, the later ones were absolute ball breakers. Even at low G's, the straps on Stop's harness dug painfully into his shoulders. As he upped the rate of speed, the quickness of deceleration, things began to get serious. First, it was a few cracked ribs, then it was several concussions, a few lost dental fillings, busted collarbone. On one run, he broke his wrist, but being the bad ass and physician he was, he set the fracture on his way back to his office. And of course, after all this, the Air Force decided this man deserved a promotion and sent him to Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico as a major to do even more insane shit. Now, you know what I'm curious about here? Because every time we talk about this, I just keep thinking about one thing, Interstellar. You remember uh, when man has the imperfect dock and he blows out the airlock and now the space station endurance is spinning just wildly and yep. Cooper has to dock, but he has to match the rotation. And so he's just sitting there like, <laughs> 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 you remember that? <laughs> And then Tars is like, Cooper, this is no time to be safe. And he's just like, <laughs> and Anne Hathaway's just like, <laughs> oh my god, that just looked like you were completely constipated. Both well, things can be true. At Holloman, Stapp made history on the Sonic Wind One rocket sled, December tenth, nineteen fifty-four hitting a high of 632 miles per hour in five seconds, put his body under 20 Gs of pressure. But it was the stop which took step from 632 to zero in 1.4 seconds. And that hit him with the record-breaking 46.2 Gs. Basically, he experienced what a car driver who crashes into a brick wall at over 120 miles per hour would have felt only it lasted perhaps nine times longer. Slowly pulled from the sled and crushed with extreme full body pain all the way into his organs, it was his eyes that felt the worst of the G-forces. They had filled with blood from bursting most of his capillaries. He was rushed to the hospital where he was temporarily blind for a day. Though he was released, his eyes would never fully recover. Listen, eye pain from an intense sonic wind is something I'm very familiar with, thanks to Taco Bell. Seriously, I, I, <laughs> like just reach out to us for your sponsorship. I love me some Taco Bell steak quesadillas with mild sauce and the Baja Blast. <laughs> the blown O-ring and eyeballs are an acceptable side effect. <laughs> and, and, and throw in a chalupa, please. A couple chalupas would be great. A couple chalupas just to lubricate things. So... <laughs> After recovering, Stapp went on to partake in wind blast tests. <laughs> Sorry. Hit me up, Taco Bell. He would fly a military jet at 570 miles per hour and pop the canopy of the jet to see if he could survive the 575 mile per hour wind gusts whipping <laughs> in his face. And he did. These tests helped the Air Force develop even faster jets now that they knew high-speed ejection was possible 9 out of 10 times in the event of an emergency. Unless you're the unlucky 10th person in line, RIP Goose. Poor Goose. Talk to me, Goose. Yeah! 
You know, when I worked at Warner Brothers, um, there was one time I went to the commissary for lunch. It's like a Tuesday or something. It's not a special day. But this was way back in the day, and they were still filming ER. Mm-hmm. And the show was winding down, and they were bringing back a lot of the, like, the OGs, right? The first cast. And so I sit down, eating my lunch, and somebody sits next to me. From my peripheral vision, I could tell, okay, bald dude, a little older scrubs medical jacket i didn't think twice about it and uh the guy asked me if uh if he mind if i've minded if he sat next to me and i was like no it's all good and i looked over to smile just as a courtesy and it was anthony edwards and the only thing i could muster to say was talk to me goose Ooh, ooh, and was he kind enough to just be like (laughs) like smile and like you're an idiot and walk away well, he was sitting next to me eating lunch already, but um, I think he saw from the expression on my face that I could tell it was a stupid thing to say, and he was gracious enough to like <laughs> laugh. And then we actually <laughs> talked. Super nice guy. Super nice. Always guy. good to hear. I, I, the, from all the years working in the entertainment industry, I can tell you the people that I know that were always nice were Hugh Jackman and Adam Sandler. The, like. Across the board, they were the nicest, nicest people. Having made aircraft safer, Stapp realized that many of the same measures could be used in cars to help keep civilians safer. With his celebrity on the rise as the fastest man on earth, Stapp was on television, magazines, and proved an international sensation. The worldwide success helped him push for the installation of seatbelts and several other safety features in cars. With continued perseverance, Stapp was able to get to President Lyndon Johnson to sign the Highway Safety Act of 1966, requiring seatbelts in all new cars sold starting in 1968. So, you know, LBJ was well known for his um, unconventional way of holding meetings. Can you imagine Stapp and probably Ralph Nader, because apparently he was involved in the whole seatbelt thing, too? This guy was a a decorated, well-known risk taker, thrill seeker, and absolutely tore down the surly bonds of earth to allow man to move closer to the stars. And he's sitting in a meeting with President Lyndon Johnson while the president dropped an open door deuce in the oval bathroom. It's crazy. I just heard about that. I heard about that from somebody on some podcast that Johnson would would take his meetings in the bathroom on the toilet. That's crazy. They're mid deuce. This guy also famously would would whip out his Johnson and he called it jumbo. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson's Johnson? Well. Johnson? Nice. You know what I'm curious is what Johnson. are the G what are the G forces of, of like when he would whip out jumbo and it would just like stop at the bottom of the arc? Like <laughs> I wonder what the G forces are for that. Point five. <laughs> Speaking of awards, Colonel John Stop won multiple awards, including the National Medal of Technology, and was made the honorary chairman of the Stop Foundation, which was underwritten by General Motors to provide scholarships for automotive engineering students. Stop died in Almogordo on November 13, 1999, at the age of 89. I'm not going to lie, part of me is kind of wondering if this dude who strapped himself to an Indiana Jones minecart with a rocket on it, who somehow lived to be 89 years old, ever warn his kids against stuff like running with scissors like what's the believability of a warning like that coming from someone like staff it's kind of like neil armstrong testing out the first lunar module prototype he survived the crash because he hit the eject button after the lunar module test vehicle leg hit the ground the vehicle touched the floor and then he ejected Really? Yeah, that's that's real. Dead ass. That happened for real. Wow. <laughs> My uh, why is this there, like there's, uh, there's an video of this story? Well, Neil Armstrong famously was like super super cool. Like, I don't know that the phrase "cool as a cucumber" was invented because of him, but if it was, it wouldn't be shocking to me because this guy. So, yeah, when they were testing the lunar module, they had, it didn't look like the one that they went up in, but the the mechanics of the body and the thruster system, you know, was basically the same. It was a proof of concept. And they felt if we can get this thing to work 
in Earth gravity, then it'll work on the moon. And so he's testing it out. And when he's trying to land it after a successful flight, it's coming down like this and it starts turning because it was just really unruly to drive this thing. First of all, the controls are inverted, but not the way that we're used to. Uh, um, you know, you almost fly it like an upside down plane, except you are right side up. And so he, they had to learn this anyway. So something happens, it starts falling. And when you look at the, at the footage from the test flight, if you go frame by frame, you can see the leg of this thing touch the floor and begin to buckle just as he starts to like, he, he hit the eject button or, or pulled the thing, whatever it was it had as it was touching the floor. Wow. I got to look this so, up. Yeah. So it's exploding as he's flying out of it. <laughs> wow. And that then you listen like some to Looney Tunes. <laughs> Yeah, Wally and then Coyotes. you listen to him talk about it, and it's like, um, yeah, I'm here to have some kind of mechanical failure, going to be ejecting shortly. I have ejected as the plane exploded and escaped by the hair on my. <laughs> uh, returning for test tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. All Easy. right. All right, folks, that's it for this episode of In the Name of Science. We know you can use your time to watch much better content than us, but you choose us anyway, and we love you for it. So we have tons of more creepy and off the rail discoveries to talk about. So if you like this episode and want more, please like, subscribe, and share. And remember, if it ain't weird, it ain't science. Science!